the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal or, and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband <clears throat> and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let these little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is as such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of a most holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. Amen. A phrase from the song that we just sung, O God of love, inspire our life Reveal your will in all that we do. Join every husband and every wife in mutual love and love for you. I want to talk to you about something that isn't an easy conversation, so I hope you will forgive me. But for those of you who are, who are new to me, I will just say that when we first moved to Western New York, Calvary Episcopal Church was our church. And I have been ordained a deacon now for <clears throat> over 24 years. And when I was ordained, the bishop asked me, you know, a, a deacon goes where the bishop tells them to go, and they have a liturgical ministry and a ministry in the world. So my liturgical ministry was to be back at Calvary for just a couple weeks and then to be a deacon at St. Paul's Cathedral in downtown Buffalo. And he asked me about my ministry of the world. And I had been working in a hospital setting like forever up until that point and even at that point. And I felt certain that he would ask me to be a hospital chaplain. And he smiled and nodded when I said that. And then I said, but, and he said, but. And I said, we've been, I was at Kenmore Mercy Hospital at the time, and the Catholic health system was Kenmore Mercy and Buffalo Mercy and St. Jerome's in Batavia. And then it grew out from there. But at the time, I was at Kenmore Mercy, and we were educating all of the management team on the prevalence and pervasiveness of domestic violence in Western New York. And so the people who are they're working with, that they're leading with, might have a couple phone calls at work and you kind of get annoyed because you shouldn't be taking that call, you should be back at your station working. Or there's a couple of times when they call in sick a little too much. And we really came to understand about how domestic violence can play out 
and how that employee being wanting to be at work because being at work is often the safest place for them to be. So I was beginning to learn a lot about this. I was certainly no expert, but when I explained that to Bishop Michael Garrison, he said, that's what you need to do. You need to be a deacon in the world, helping people understand about domestic violence. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> because I was really drawn to it. And I will tell you a reason for being drawn to it. My younger, my only sister, younger sister, got married and was pregnant. And she had a husband who from time to time could get a little vocal about things. But domestic violence is what I want to tell you a little bo bit more about today. Um, domestic violence is not an anger control problem. It is a misuse of power and control. So there's often times where we're dating someone and we're fianced with them and then there's a honeymoon and you're home with them and all of a sudden something seems a little off and you might be walking on eggshells. Someone may be telling you, the offender may be telling you that didn't like the dinner that you made or it was a little burnt or a little dry or whatever it might be that normally you would say, ooh, you know, this could have been a little better or whatever. But instead, he took power and control over her at that dinner. And they had a, yesterday we celebrated St. Francis and we did the blessing of animals. And misuse of animals is, um, abusing animals is one of the things that is a hallmark and a red flag for what can be happening in a relationship between a man and a woman, or a woman and a woman, or a man and a man, but um, an intimate partner relationship. And Angelo picked up this brand new kitten, weaned, but like, you know, that puffball stage where there's just absolute cuteness, right? He picked up the kitten and he flung the cat against the dining room wall. My sister loves animals almost more than humans, and she burst into tears. She was pregnant. This was like a horrific thing. And she came and spoke to me the next day and told me what happened. I was not someone who was well-schooled on domestic violence at that time, but I knew that that was damn wrong. It was inappropriate for him to do that. And we started to lay plans together on how to get her out of that relationship. Um, I'll just stop there for that little vignette. You know, when we get married, we're promised to um, love and obey and sickness and in health and, you know, forsaking all others. And that's part of what the gospel is getting to. I have heard it said that in recent times, a Jewish man could say to his wife three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And I'm certain that there's paperwork that goes along with that, but that is that. In Jesus' time, a woman would be betrothed to her intended and then would begin to stay with their family. And if the groom, so to speak, didn't think that the dowry was enough, he would just say that he didn't want to marry her. They may not have done anything conjugal, I'll say, because kids are in, the, in with us, but the fact that she was living in that family and he didn't like the dowry, he threw her out, and because of the situation, she could never marry another person. It didn't matter whether she was a virgin or not. That's the kind of hardness of heart thing that I think Jesus is talking about. They may just decide that there's someone better that they would like and they write her a certificate of divorce and then he goes and does what he needs to do. That's part of the hardness of heart that Jesus is talking about. Because in those days, if you were a widow, 
justifiable widow or someone who was tossed out, you had no one to go to unless he had a brother and you could somehow finesse and finagle to be cared for because women didn't work outside of the home back then. It was very, very, um, well, probably not too often did they work outside the home. But there's a, a scripture that's always misquoted by clergy or by um, one of the fine upstanding people that is offending against this man or this woman. And they would say that, um, whoops, it's the book of Ephesians. And the man will say that you must submit to me because I am head of the house and you must do everything that I tell you that you do because we agreed to that in marriage. But the book of Ephesians doesn't mean that you, or that scripture doesn't mean that you will submit to his abuse. Actually, the scripture passage refers to a husband and wife relationship by saying, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the starting point for all of our relationships from when we get baptized and moving forward. Here, the words be subject to means to accommodate or to give way to. And it means that we don't always get our way. Sometimes we allow, you know, we find that happy medium of, of things. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So we are all, regardless of our relationship to each other, to be concerned for each other's welfare as also our own. And I will tell you that there is a grooming honeymoon period that goes on with the domestic violence relationship. Because it is not an anger management problem, it is a misuse of power and control. So times when things are going great and everything is well and then something happens and there's an explosion and the woman is always doubting herself and quite often the man is telling her um, it's your fault you made me do this and it just blows my mind that beyond physical battery there is economic abuse prevent her from getting a job or keeping a job. So coming to church is a safe place. Going to work becomes that safe place. Giving her an allowance, but taking her money from the job and not letting her know about or have access to family income. Using coercion and threats, making or carrying out threats to do something to hurt her. That was Angelo for my sister threatening to leave her, to commit suicide, to report her to welfare, making her drop charges, making her do illegal things. Is that happily ever after marriage? No. Using intimidation, making her afraid by using looks. Now, most of us who are moms can give a different kind of a look to your child when you know they are just need to be kind of seated and a little better. But these kind of looks are horrific intimidation looks and actions, gestures. They'll destroy her property. Maybe there is a keepsake that she had from her great grandmother and he knows it means a lot to her. Bam, it's gone using emotional abuse, putting her down, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy. There are times when during that explosive period, she might call 911 and be reduced to tears in the corner of the living room and the police come and I will just say female and male for this instance, but it can be between any two partners. If if you understand what I'm saying. And he will stand there just inside the door with the police and chat with them and be totally composed because he misused power. 
she's the one that looks like she has melted and is emotionally unstable and all the things that he might say about her, which is awful. It's absolutely awful. And you get those things said to you and about you the certain number of times you begin to believe it. And if she says that I might go and tell Father Robert or I might go and tell Deacon Leanne about this, he'll say, they won't believe you because look at who I am. I'm more than tithe to the church. It's crazy making. Because there are some clergy people that are afraid to do the wrong thing. We gotta make our budget, right? Wrong. They can use isolation. They can minimize things that are happening, denying and blaming. They can use the children as pawns and you know, there's this thing called male privilege. And when we do it reciprocally, like it says in Ephesians, it's male and female privilege pulling together. But treating her like a servant, making all the big decisions, and acting like master of the castle, being one of those who defined men's and women's roles as appropriate according to them. So my role um, as a deacon has been for a little over 24 years. And of course, Bishop Garrison gave me this wonderful opportunity. And I became a member of the Erie County Coalition Against Family Violence. And I really learned a lot being a part of that and also with what was going on in the Catholic health system. So I'm very grateful to God for that. And as timing would have it, our coalition was really trying to plan, is there a way that we could have one place where people would go to? Because if someone confessed to me, I would need to get them to crisis services, and then there would be Haven House, and there would be an order of protection from family court, and there might be, if he's a repeat offender or other types of things, they had a sexual defense squad with the Buffalo Police Department. There's all these places that you have to hop to. And, you know, if you're just barely telling me that this is an issue, and I might drive with you to those places, but it's hard. It's really hard. So we were dreaming about a one-stop shop where you could go and have everyone come to you to hear your story. And as it turned out, George W. Bush was in charge at that time, and the Office of Violence Against Women, money was allocated for 10 grants to be given nationwide. And our Coalition Against Family Violence applied for one of the grants. And we developed the Family Justice Center that is downtown. Now, I'm clergy, so all these people are like big players. You know, we have... Um, you know, people in the court system, Lisa Black Rodwin was a family judge, um, family court judge. Jessica Pirro was someone who uh, was very powerful within crisis services. There were a lot of different players that I was really blessed for the opportunity to work with. And when we got awarded the grant, we hired someone to be our CEO, and he needed someone to help him help us. So I took a part-time job at the Family Justice Center, which turned into be a full-time job while I was canon for pastoral care at the cathedral. And I developed the operations manual so that all of the agencies would come together and work well on the sandbox together. Um, I also helped to design and train and install the chaplain's program for people who are victims of family violence. They, when they are strong in their faith, but they're told, you just need to go bear your cross. Remember Father Robert told us about picking up our cross. This is not what that means. But there are clergy who are uninformed and don't understand how to best help a person. 
it's easier to kind of just say something that kind of kicks the can down the road. So when you have a volunteer chaplain at the Family Justice Center and you hear their story about how they were told that they don't pray hard enough or they don't do this or that for God, and you know darn well that that has just been proof texted and blaming emotional and um, psychological violence against the woman. It's nice to have a person there who's not proselytizing, but able to be a presence and helping them to see where God or their higher power is at in that situation at that time. I also helped to develop the child waiting area because the way the FJC, the Family Justice Center works, is the child waiting area um, is off to the side and it's not in the living room settings where the person who's seeking support will sit because we don't want the kids to be reoffended by listening to mom or dad tell his story because we've had male victims of family violence and I used to be an advocate with crisis services. And when I visit the hospital, when they call, there have been a couple of men that were in that situation. And there have been many women who are in that situation. And if we say one in four women or one in six men, I know most of you guys might be coming back for the four o'clock service, and any of you watching this on TV, you know, I hope that you're paying attention um, because it's really important that we help to understand that so much of what is being told to people and not wanting to traumatize the child again and again is so key. So I get referrals. Um, when I first started out and people found out about me, I had clergy from the Episcopal Diocese of Western New York consult with me when they found that a woman was going to marry a man for which they could see because the man was a part of the congregation and knew how the father operated and so forth. So oftentimes this is a learned behavior. And so they would consult with me and say, well, what do you think? And based on just what they gave me, I would say I'm not certain that now is the time for them to be joined. And sometimes they would thank me and the people would get married anyhow. And then we have problems. I mean, I'm not the person with the holy sacred eyes, but some of the things can be so telling in how people treat each other. If it's domestic violence, the guy, um, for example, could be totally cool and they're suave and they know everything that they need to say so that people understand that they are a good person to be around. They can be judges, doctors, attorneys, um, bank managers, fill in the blank about the kinds of situations that you might be employed in or CEO of a hospital or things like that. And they basically say that no one will believe you if you go to tell them that I'm doing this. And they isolate and they do so many things. Um, the Family Justice Center was very, very helpful. And we had satellites that branched out from there because not everyone, especially from rural Erie County, necessarily wants to try to get to downtown Buffalo because where do I park? Where do I do this or that? And with the advantage of, well, I can't say advantage, but with the, with the years that we lived through COVID and we had access to Zoom and a lot of other ways to do visual, uh, we were able to counsel with people while they maybe were in their own home or in someone's office. And that was our goal when I was at the Family Justice Center was to have a way for the family court judge to issue an order of protection while she was with us in safe surroundings. So I just want to share a story, a more recent story, that I hope that will help you to feel really good about living in New York State and knowing how far we have come in helping to advocate for women who are in unsafe situations. 
or men who are in unsafe situations. I, I have um, some ongoing education beyond my master's in mental health and health coaching, life coaching, and I do creative depth coaching because there are times you can't, that's where you use art. And there's times that you can't find the words for what to say, but you can create some art and talk about the art and things come to the surface and they can come to the surface in a very safe setting. So people knew um, what I did as a chaplain or a spiritual, spiritual direction. And I received a phone call from one of my colleagues in New Mexico. And she says, Leanne, you have got to talk to this woman. She's going to give you a call. And you know, this past year has been very much political phone call roulette. And I said, well, could you just tell me her, her phone number? And while I was asking her to give me the phone number, my f other phone was ringing and I said, I'll let you go, I, th I think this is her. And we spoke and I set up a Zoom with her and her situation had nothing to do with battery. She never had a bruise, she never had a scrape. She was always financially, emotionally, psychologically isolating. Um, even sexual misconduct in, in a marriage, if it's not consensual. And he was a classic offender. And there were times when it got so horrible and it was in front of the kids that she would call 911 and they would come and they would see him being calm and her being upset. She is an amazing woman of faith. I will just tell you, because her faith has been exactly what's gotten her through this. But I've spent several weeks and months working with her to give her a safety plan. Because in Ohio, where she's from, if you don't have physical proof on your body that you've been offended against, they can't give you an order of protection. That's nuts. He was poisoning her. They wouldn't do um, a blood level for what she knew that he was poisoning her with because that was on the inside and there was no, I mean, she was losing hair, but okay. She needed to get an order of protection. She couldn't get that. She wanted a divorce because there's no way when he started this, it was the offender that broke the vows of marriage. And when you think of, in Jewish terms, the term shalom bayit, it means peace in the home. There's no way that there was peace in that home. And the child is observing and learning and, you know, trying to get in the middle of the fight of what's going on. And so she couldn't get anyone from the... Ohio Domestic Violence Unit to sit with her for the order of protection because there was no physical proof. And she was trying to get at least um, a separation order from the judge. She had to pay for the attorney and she had no money. And there wasn't a way for her, she couldn't find a way to know who was working pro bono who could help her with that. And it's something that right now she is in a safe place. I helped her with a safety plan. Um, her kids are doing well, they're in counseling. But it just really upsets me that for someone who's going through so much, there wasn't even a way through their church for someone to intervene and try to link her to an attorney who possibly could do pro bono work for her. She's a strong, faith-filled woman, and I am so proud of her, and I'm so proud of what God has done in and through her, but not every woman has that strength. And she's allowed me to share this story with you. I've been working with her since, well, those of you that are on the prayer chain know her name, and I don't wanna mention her name 
because part also of what he did, and I, I promise I'll wrap up in a moment, is that he knew everything that she did. He had cameras hidden throughout the house. When she was on the Zoom or the phone talking with me, she knew that what she was saying, he would know. Those are dangerous things. Those are very dangerous things. On top of that, she it was um, a functional medicine intern, and she would go to this doctor's office and interview clients and you know, do the things that interns do in those settings. And when she would come home for dinner, her husband would ask her about Jane Smith. And isn't that interesting that she has a problem with her thyroid? And it's like, this is HIPAA, folks. Um, let me compose myself. How the heck did he know those particular things? I said, what about your pen? Do you have like a favorite pen? Could he have put something in there? You carry your cell phone on you. Could he possibly have installed something or other? She had her, um, her car was being bugged also, but she couldn't, she took the car into the shop at my, I really got schooled this past year, um, to see if they could sweep it for bugs, and there was nothing that they could find. And she was trying to pay someone to sweep for bugs in her apartment, or in the condo that they have. And it's something, it can run like $10,000 to do it properly. The police wouldn't help her because they had other things they had to do. This was just, you know, emotional. So please, if someone comes to you and they say that there is an issue that they have a concern about and they begin to disclose something like this, I would absolutely pray that you would say, you are not alone, tell me more. And then link them to someone, like at crisis services or the Family Justice Center, or maybe it's too scary, and you can link them to Father Robert or myself, because I've been working with this for 24 years and I know how to make linkages to people in the right places. I have my business cards at the back of the church on the table. They say nothing about domestic violence, but um, it talks about spiritual care and so forth. And that's what I can do. I have a master's in mental health counseling. I don't have a license. That's a whole story. But I would love to, um, to be of support with you because sometimes we don't know what to say and saying nothing when someone was brave enough to whisper, you know, back when I was in school, this would be 66, in sixth grade, they had one girl in our class, her, her parents were divorced. And people would have cancer. And at that time, nobody whispered about family violence. Yeah, you knew about child abuse and lots of different things like that. But we want to break the silence on domestic violence, and we want people that can come forward know that there's a safe place for them to go to. And I just want to close with a prayer that is in Joyce Rupp's book, Bread for the Journey. Oh God, in mystery and silence you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. I'll just say that... Um, I have a pin for everyone, everyone. Um, I used to take little purple skinny ribbon and try to put a baby safety pin in the back. My hands are older now in 24 years, so this is something that's got the pin thing in the back. And at the end of the service, 
I will stand with Father Robert back there, and I'm going to give each person a pin. If you really don't want one, that's okay. But I want you, if one in four women know someone that has been hurt, if one in four women might have been hurt themselves, please help us stop the silence. People will look at your pen and say, what's that? And in a different month, it might be for lupus, just saying. <laughs> I was surprised how many purple ribbon um, things that there are. But I will have a pen for you, and rather than during the prelude to meet me at St. Luke's Chapel for prayer, following um, probably everyone leaving the church and heading into coffee hour, um, I will be back at St. Luke's and I will be happy to offer prayers for anyone that would like them, like we do normally on, on Sundays. Thank you for listening. <laughs>